And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. We're joined right now by Scarla Fu in the TV studio, Carol Masser and Tim Stenevic in that thing we call the fishbowl. Welcome to our audiences across all this of our Bloomberg platforms. Us, okay? okay, and you are the two of the best looking fish I've Thank ever seen. Appreciate that. Sure thing. <laughs> we're real fast. I think Nemo's calling. Um, having said that, what an interesting week. I feel like just when we kind of have a Fed meeting and we have a certain narrative and Jay kind of plays down this idea of maybe a uh, rate cut anytime soon, I feel like well, wait a minute, just give it, what, 48 hours, and you get not even 48 hours, and you get a different thing when it comes to rates. Yeah, I think a week ago we were kind of asking, okay, what's going to be the most consequential event to happen next week? Is it Apple earnings? Is it Amazon earnings? Is it Fred Chair Powell's press conference? Or is it the employment report? And I think it's easy to say today, well, with the reset that we saw in rates post the employment report, that softer than expected number, it was certainly that this morning. Yeah, but this is one data point, right? And the Fed yes. is data dependent, so we got to wait for CPI. we got to wait for those other inflation measures to, to back stop what we're getting from this latest jobs report. But the thing is, if the Fed is data dependent, then how do we front run the, pet, the Fed? So if they're data dependent, they're going to look at everything that we're looking at. How is the market going to front run like they normally Therein do? Therein lies the frustration. Right. I mean, I mean, you look at the, the Fed's done absolutely nothing, and yet the two-year yield's been all over the place, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you answered your own question. I mean, I think it means we're going to have a lot of volatility <laughs> up ahead, and I uh, guess the direction uh, the market will sort that out. All right, let's walk you through the numbers here, because uh, earlier this week, it looked like we were really heading uh, for a down week, but all the major indices today rallying for a second straight day, and all the major indices now closing out the week on a high note. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to close out the day higher by about more than 400 points or about 1.2 percent. That's going to be good enough for a gain of about a percent on the week. The S&P 500 up about 64 points or 1.3 percent. The Nasdaq Composite up 2 percent on the day, a more than 300 uh, point gain here on the day. And the Russell 2000, just take a look at that. Uh, not the strongest showing on the day here, only up about a percent, so lagging the rest of the sector. But I was just taking a quick look here, at least among the major indices here. That's your outperforming on a weekly basis. The Russell up about 1.7 on the week. All right, back to the big caps I go in the S&P 500. Just a big, broad picture, guys. And 378 names in the S&P 500 actually gaining ground today. 122 to the downside and Scarlet 3 unchanged. So a more of a risk on trade, no doubt about it. Absolutely. That's a pretty lopsided split there in terms of uh, gainers versus losers. Let's take a look at the IMAP, which shows the sector performances in the S&P 500, a big pie with a lot of green. Um, in terms of the 11 sector groups, the only industry group that finished in the red, and that's just barely, is energy as oil prices fall for a fifth day. But really tech leading the way with the Infotech index up 3%, the biggest section of the S&P 500. And that, of course, is led by Apple, communication services, and materials, each gaining at least 1% as well. All right, off to the individual gainers I go. And check this out, guys. In a day where Apple, yes, did well, big earnings report. We watched it. We broke it down last night. The number one gainer in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 is, drumroll please, is Amgen, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, up almost 16% at its highs today, finishing the day with about just shy of a 12% gain, soaring up at uh, the most in its intraday high, going all the way back to, I think it was 2009. Uh, the CEO coming out and saying he was very encouraged by early results from a study by the company's experimental obesity drug. What's interesting is we talked with our Madison Muller saying, I don't know that there was anything necessarily new in this news, but nonetheless, investors sat up and took note. All right, another one. Uh, Scarlett, you mentioned Apple. It was definitely among my big gainers of the day, up about 6%, finishing, though, off that 8% high earlier in the session. Uh, we know uh, the stock jumping after the company posted stronger-than-expected sales last quarter, predicting a return to growth in the current period. So that sparked some optimism that maybe the slowdown at the company is easing. Uh, revenue was down, we know, 4.3% in the March quarter, but it was better than what analysts were projecting in terms of the overall number. Profit topping, too. And then, of course, they had uh, the biggest uh, buyback that they announced in their history. So again, uh, an outperformer. Live Nation, another one. Did you one? happen to see that that Bloomberg story, Carol, where they showed Which the one? biggest buybacks of all time? Um, yes. And it was just Apple, 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 Apple. Apple, Apple. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was so funny 
when we were talking about it with Anarug, he's like, listen, they always do a big buyback, but this was a really big well, buyback. You know, Boeing's market cap, $110 billion. <laughs> oh, well, maybe they buyback. should buy, oh, you're just $110 hint, billion. Dollars. Oh, so no Apple car, but maybe an Apple plane. Is that what you're saying, <laughs> maybe, Tim? All maybe. Right. I don't know if you saw the Bloomberg opinion piece about uh, Warren Buffett say. potentially buying uh, Boeing. Yeah, Not I saying it's going to happen, mm -hmm. but, you know, among the most read he has on the, the cash Bloomberg to terminal. Do it, he right? definitely has the cash to do it. Did I cut you off, Carol? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. Live Nation, another one. Uh, number four gainer in the S&P 500. This one up, uh, just checking my Bloomberg, up about 7% here. Uh, the company reported first quarter results that beat expectations. These were all the earnings we were breaking down yesterday. All right, over to you. Okay, speaking of earnings that we were breaking down yesterday, got to check in on uh, shares of Expedia because in terms of decliners, this one we got to talk about falling 15.3%. Shares hitting their lowest level going back to November. The company did post uh, disappointing first quarter bookings also lowered its full year guidance. The company came out on the earnings call and blamed uh, a slower than expected recovery in Verbo, its vacation rental business, uh, and saw slower than expected growth in the rest of its consumer business as well. Expedia CEO Peter Kern did say on the earnings call that Verbo has lost share to Airbnb and to Booking Holdings, which is the parent company of Kayak and Priceline. Also, Carol mentioned uh, Amgen move higher. Well, as a result of Amgen moving higher on the news uh, that it has made progress on a potential weight loss drug. We saw shares of the GLP-1 makers Eli Lilly uh, and Novo Nordisk move lower today. Lilly, the maker of Munjaro and Zepbound, Novo, the maker of Wegovi and Ozempic. Uh, shares of Eli Lilly closing down about 2.8% after Amgen's uh, CEO said he was, quote, very encouraged by early results from a study of Maritide. And finally, Cloudflare, ticker NET, the cybersecurity company, fell as much as Wow, close to 18% uh, today, finishing the day lower by uh, 16. Yeah, a lot, a, is that 15 or 16, guys? Help me out here. That's 15. 15. Yeah, um, Look almost, at that. Almost, oh, is it 16? <laughs> yeah, isn't it? This is why we got to get a return. You know, this is why we got to get a return monitor in here. Just, <laughs> or, or better glasses. Or better glasses. Maybe, that, maybe that's what it is. Um, biggest fall since going back to uh, just uh, April of last year. The company did uh, post uh, second quarter revenue projections, fell short of analyst expectations. Uh, analysts did say that a strong first quarter report was overshadowed by that weak forecast. Cloudflare. Also, the other cybersecurity companies, they've faced headwinds in recent months as businesses have scaled back that spend when it does come to IT. All right, let's go to yields here because they did stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, buying across the <laughs> curve, uh, we saw much more extreme buying once the jobs number uh, came out at 830. Then the ISM services kind of tempered that buying a little bit. Uh, and you saw a little bit more buying kind of in the belly of the curve. But weekly, guys, it was pretty tremendous. The two-year yield is down at one point as much as 28 basis points. The 10-year down 21 basis points. This is at the max uh, of, uh, of the move lower in yields. And the two-year yield kind of just cratered below its 50-day uh, and 200-day uh, move moving average. Uh, so there's just some technical levels that were hit. That's why I keep mentioning positioning, positioning. Uh, and I do wonder what's going to be the next catalyst for yield. So I was like a month out early for NVIDIA, but like there's nothing happening next week in terms of economic data, for example. You know, I feel like we need to give a shout out to the yen as well, given mm -hmm. the Smart. monster yeah, moves that. in that currency, that currency pair, especially dollar yen uh, for the week, dollar losing 3.4 percent versus the Japanese currency. We haven't gotten any confirmation that the um, finance ministry is behind any uh, yen support, but presumably the, what else could have driven the yen to, to such extreme moves over the, over the last couple of days? Yeah, I mean, 152, I mean, quite remarkable here. And we talk about the catalyst for next week. We do get some earnings out of Disney and a few other kind of second tier companies. But I'm going to use this as a shameless plug uh, for our coverage uh, that Carol and I uh, will have uh, at the Milken Conference. We'll have a big conversation uh, over the next uh, three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, with a lot of the biggest asset managers, a lot of folks in the private equity and private capital space. You see a couple of big names up there, including Katie Koch over at uh, TCW, Ray McGuire over at Lazard, and Ann Walsh. Uh, Carol over mm -hmm. at Guggenheim. Yeah, listen, this is a great place to, it's everybody and anybody, certainly in the financial sector, and there's more players and certainly traditional business, but it really, you get a good gut check about what's top of mind for folks who are managing so much money globally, and especially at a time when there are so many questions and big macro ash, uh, issues, whether it's geopolitics, artificial intelligence, uh, you do wonder what's top of mind, and even like you look at the volatility we see in the bond market, Scarlett, as we are data-dependent, 
moving from data point to data point. Curious to see what really kind of tracks with them in terms of what they are focusing on to make those investment decisions. One thing, of course, that we should note is that um, the event will be in West LA, which is fairly close to the UCLA campus. I'm mm. curious uh, whether college students and their alleged outside agitators um, might hold demonstrations here in the Beverly Hilton. It's one thing to protest on campus, calling for your school's endowment to disclose and divest, but some of the fund managers who are investing the school's money will be well, attending the conference. And you know? yeah, that's They're a good the ones point. directing the investments. I mean, I was there in 2021 and 2022 and there were protests uh, taking place and it was, yeah. uh, I would think you would, it was fair to say it was a calmer um, environment mm -hmm. across yeah. the country at the that point. I, I, I sort of chuckled because, and I, I think we were there that same year they had, they had those protests, but I, yeah. I thought it was, I chuckled because they, they made sure they, they could have kept them on, I can't remember what that one street is, so they kept them on that one side there uh, <laughs> yes. and away from the main, main entrances. So yeah, as you know, uh, security is tight, but yeah, I, I agree with Scarlett. Um, you know, I, I'm sure uh, some of those people might uh, feel the need to stop on by. So it's on, it's on you guys yeah. though. Carol, yeah. Romaine, you guys gotta make the news next week. All right, Whew. pressure. Okay, Pressure's so on. or All else, right. if nothing happens, it's on you guys. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, okay. <laughs> All right guys, listen, have a great, great weekend. That's a wrap, our cross-platform radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, we call it Beyond the Bell. Join us though for all our special coverage next week and have a great weekend, everybody.